Hello, I am art prof teaching artist Lauren Welch. Welcome to our stream. I am here today with Professor Liu, and today we are going to be talking about tips for MFA interviews. Big thing happening right now. But first, if your studio habits need a kick in the butt, Art Prof has everything you need, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. It is interview season right now, and what that means is that if you are an MFA candidate or an MFA applicant that has put in your application and you get back a notice in the mail that says you've passed the first round, the next round is that you go to an interview at the school, generally speaking. So Clara, what general tips do you have if you're going into this interview? Well, a lot of the tips that we're going to talk about today, really, you can use in any interview. It doesn't have to be for an MFA, although we will get specific about what an MFA demands, because I think a lot of artists are not good at public speaking. I think a lot of us are just not used to it. We don't have a ton of experience doing it, generally speaking. And so my advice is to practice talking about your work. And one thing that I do, it's very silly, but the way I got better at public speaking is I practice when I'm driving in the car by myself. <laughs> so I don't get on anybody's nerves at home. And really that helps a lot to say it out loud and to practice. I don't know, did you ever practice public speaking like that? No. Clara, what did you say to yourself in the car? I want to hear an excerpt of your introduction to your work. Well, I would think about maybe they would ask me this question or actually what I think is very helpful and every artist should have this, the elevator pitch. Yes. One sentence that sums up really quickly who you are as the initial overview and then you can dig deeper. So for example, if you asked me, I would say, my work is about the extremities of the human emotion, using the human figure as a vehicle for expression. I work largely in drawing, printmaking, and sculpture. Really simple. Wow, it does not have great. to be that complicated. I that have my great. elevator pitch, Lauren. <laughs> I, I had an elevator pitch prepared when we had to put those together in college when I was in my last year of my BFA. And it was for those kinds of things, for shows, for jobs, for applying to an MFA. We had to do that exact elevator pitch, work it down to two sentences. And the thing about it, guys, is that this is going to change over time. My elevator pitch that I created when I was a senior in college is not the same as the elevator pitch that I would do now. And the more that you are working and creating in the studio, the more and the faster that's going to change. So this is something similar to your artist statement where you have to keep at it. You don't just do it once. I do think it's helpful to write an artist statement in conjunction with figuring out how to say it out loud. Because I find, at least for me, when I write something, it feels more concrete. I feel like I understand it better. So that's a really good exercise. You're going to have to do it anyway. So you might as well do it in conjunction with actually preparing for the interview. Now, Lauren, you and I were actually talking before the stream that so many tips are the tips that we use here on our streams because I actually have with me this little checklist <laughs> that we made here at Art Prof before the streams. And so what, what's on that checklist, Lauren? That actually would have been helpful. The behind the scenes. <laughs> Guys, if I had done Art Prof live streams at the time that I was doing my interviews for school, I probably would have gotten into the places I wanted to go on the first try. It really changes your life to know how to talk. But some of the things we go over are to talk slowly, don't trip over yourself. When you get very nervous and you're in the setting where you're talking to new people that are potentially judging your future of whether you get into school or not, I have the tendency to talk very, very fast. 
Another thing we have on this list is to not use filler words. So words like like or um or really or things like that, which make you sound less professional, even though we all use them in everyday speech. It's it's fine to use them. You're just in a very specific setting. Oh, Neil's got one here, too. That's really good. <laughs> This is great. Literally, this is what it says on my stream list. Avoid monologues. And really what we're saying is when you're at the interview, you got to leave space for the interviewer to interject and react to what you're saying. And if you just go on rambling and rambling, it's like you don't give them an opportunity to actually come in and interact with you, which is sort of the whole point of the interview. So I find that I usually cut myself sooner than I want to, but that's usually just about right. Hard. <laughs> Hard. <laughs> yeah. So other tips I would also say, make eye contact. Have you ever mm. been in an interview where the person you're talking to won't look at you and it just feels evasive and awkward? Yeah, I find this one really hard because when, or I feel like it's more like a dance. So you want to be able to mirror the body language and the eye contact and the emotional tenor of the person that you are across from or conversing with that generates a, a bonding and empathy, a rapport. But I also don't think you need to make eye contact all the time and stare someone down. I know that when I talk when I'm thinking about something and trying to put it together, I will look up and piece that together while I'm talking and get into the bulk of my discussion. And then when I wrap up a little bit, I will make eye contact to see whether that point has landed and if the person has any questions in their face, you want to see the reaction. So, you know, it's not this all eye contact all the time time thing, at least in my case. What about you, Clara? Yeah, I would say you don't want to stare at somebody, but I've interviewed people who will not make any eye contact. Right. And I find that a little bit awkward. On the flip side, I also think you should be an active listener. For example, <laughs> I once was saying to my dear, I said, why do all the students Everybody come to me with all their problems. Like, why am I the only person that gets this? He said, because you're a very active listener. I said, what do you mean? He's like, because you nod and you are really paying attention to the person. And I think that's important because I've interviewed people and I'm like, are you listening to me? So it's not just speaking, but also just that interaction is huge. Making the interviewer yeah. understand that you're really paying attention and you're really invested in what's going on. I think that's the most important point is that you stay present. I think eye contact can be really difficult for some people on, on a pretty intense scale. And so as long as you can continue to put out signals that you are present in the conversation, whatever that is, that is okay. Orange Cat says, mixing, writing, and talking. That's confusing to me because I don't type how I talk. When I talk, it's a lot of slang, banter, and fast. When I type artist statement, it's professional. It's not so much that we're telling you to mix the two, but rather that for a lot of people, they have not written lots of artist statements at that point. And sometimes when you write it down, it helps you organize your thoughts more. Because the way I speak is nothing like the way I write it's a little bit related, but yeah, it's a completely different language. But I do think that when you have to write something, you have to be more clear than when it's some random abstract <laughs> thought that you have in your head and you have to communicate it to somebody. It can be very, very difficult. Agreed. Now, Lauren, what about knowledge of art history and contemporary art? Because I know a lot of people are nervous about that. They say, well, how much am I supposed to know? Are they going to grill me about my experience there? What's your recommendation for that? You don't have to know every contemporary artist that's active right now. I am personally notorious with being unable to match an artist's work with a name. It's very hard for me, but you do need to know where your artwork fits within the general 
context of art history. So for instance, I know that the types of paintings that I make are very much influenced by post-impressionist French painters. And I can list the top five post-impressionist French painters that I've been looking at. And then maybe you want to have a few contemporary artists that you are interested in, and also artists from the college or the university that you are interested in learning from. You should at least have that much knowledge. They're not going to give you, they're not going to say, oh, we need you to be a historian, but you, you do need to have some, you can't just say, oh, I like drawing birds. That's, that's not enough. I think I would also recommend that a lot of that process is just knowing how to contextualize your work. Like, where do you belong in the history of art? I know that sounds dramatic, but it's true. I, that's what they yeah. want to know. And also contemporary wise, where are you in the landscape of contemporary art today? It's more expressing an awareness of what came before you because when I'm teaching high school or college and I'll ask students, hey, are there any artists you like? Nine times out of 10, oh, well, I like these people. I don't really know their names and I'm just bad. You cannot do that. <laughs> in an MFA interview, it's gonna be very embarrassing. So your example, Lauren, of, oh, I'm familiar with these post-impressionist painters, that's enough. I mean, you're not interviewing for a PhD in art history. So I don't think that's a problem. Right. Jessica is asking, can being late make or break an interview? What do you think, Lauren? Don't be late. I, if, if, you're gonna, <laughs> if you're going to be late or, I mean, sometimes you can't help it. Sometimes travel really does get in the way, especially if you're traveling from a long ways away, but you want to be in communication with the people that maybe you are interviewing with that, hey, this is where I'm at right now, as soon as possible, as soon as you know. And as far as right now goes with, with COVID and everything, I unless your internet is down, which does happen, I feel like there's very little excuse not for you to be ready for your interview right when it starts. And that's how people generally take it. Inter internet issues happen this has happened, things that are beyond that, no. My feeling is it does, because I have interviewed people in the past and I've had people show up late and I had one woman show up late, she didn't apologize, nothing. And I was like, it's over. I, I'm not gonna consider you at this point because I could not believe she didn't apologize to me yeah. and I didn't get a phone call in advance, there was nothing. My feeling is that unless you're hit by a car, you better be there. Because you know something? In interview, people are on their best behavior. And if your yeah. best behavior is showing up late, that's pretty bad. And then I have to think, well, if that's your best behavior, what are you going to do when you're in the program and not following? So I don't know. I'm sort of a hard ass about it because you, you are. I make a lot of effort to be places I need to be. Why shouldn't somebody else? So this is this is the thing. I am more generous than you, Clara, a lot more generous than you about these things. But I do believe in this idea of good judgment. And so I'm a person that is a late is late for a lot of things a lot of the time. But one thing that I try to always be on time on no matter what is for interviews and for my classes, because those interactions really matter. And I think for your class, I think I was on time all the time except for once and that was really hard to do so you just want to focus your efforts of not being late to this one particular thing and that says a lot that you can at least do that <laughs> kevin is asking can you give us examples of sample questions that may be asked so this is for you lauren because you've done interviews very recently it's really set up a lot like a critique so they will ask you which artists you're looking at. They'll make some comments about your work. I have been asked, do you use photography in your work? Because my images have a, a photo sensibility to them some of the time. I also get, or I've also seen questions that are, what are you reading right now? That one, 
felt really out of the box when I first got it, but every school seems to ask this and you have to come up with a result. It's kind of like if someone asks you, what's your favorite artist? What's your favorite music? You And they're not looking for a particular answer necessarily. It's just sometimes these oblique questions give a better idea of who you are as a person beyond who you are as an artist, which is also very important for your MFA. Clara, what were questions that you were asked? Is there a generational difference? I mean, I didn't do interviews because the school oh, yeah. I went to did not do interviews. And my whole MFA experience was a total crap storm. So <laughs> I did not have the typical experience. But I can tell you, if I was interviewing students, I would want to know about what their practice is. And I would ask them, why are you getting an MFA? What is your reason for going? Yes. And what I would be very conscious of is to not say the generic reply, which is, I want to teach and I want to be part of a community of artists. That's a given. Everybody knows you want to do that. So you have to find a response that is very particular to you. Why do you want to get an MFA? Not why does everybody <laughs> want to get an MFA? Like, did they ask you that, Lauren? Oh, yeah. Every single... That was the hardest question, really. And we were talking about this before because... I was one of those people that really did want to teach and had lots of teaching experience. And I had to come up with an answer that was very specific to me. So I think what I brought up was that I was interested in alternative forms of teaching that were not a part of the university and then brought up art prof and things like that. But you want to... If you're going to answer those questions, you have to find a way to make it as specific to you as possible. Why, what is your specific, what does your specific context and personality in the world have to generate to, or have to contribute to the art world? Similarly, don't ever just say, oh, I want to show in a gallery. That's a bad no, 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 no. Because academia is really against this idea of just going in for the commercial, uh, you know, fancies. No, no, no go. Maya Hika is saying, why do I feel like MFA interviews are like job interviews? Because they are. I mean, I think any interview, whatever situation it is, it's sort of the same rules. It's just that the content that's discussed is different, different questions for different situations. But yeah, I mean, Basically, there is not a huge difference in terms of an MFA interview and a job interview. Neil is asking, should you be funny during interviews or do you have to be super serious? It's okay to have some, some levity. It's okay to laugh. I think you want to come in and be easygoing, but I would strongly recommend not trying to be sarcastic or not trying to land any jokes about the school or being maybe critical of people or institutions or things like that. That's a little bit risky. I was in a situation at a school where one of my parting remarks was one that I thought was a joke, but kind of ended up seeming like a dig at the school. And then I did not get into that school. So, and I don't know if it was because of that, but I have that constantly in the back of my head that I said that was not very good judgment. So just be, you can be funny, you can be easygoing, but be nice. And don't say anything negative about your undergrad program or about a professor because it's just not good practice. Right. Even if you feel that way, that's fine that you feel that way, but keep it to yourself because you don't know. Maybe the person that's interviewing you is like friends with people that teach at that school. You could totally accidentally make somebody pretty mad by doing that. Yeah. Elizabeth saying, I've been on the interviewing side a lot for postdoc positions. I really recommend people check in advance what the clothing Ooh. expectations at the place are. I have seen lots of faux pas. What's your take on that, Lauren? I would like to know more from Elizabeth because I, <laughs> I do not think of that one. I just kind of go as I dress, which is a little bit patterny and not totally. A little bit? <laughs> you know. I feel like there's a dressed up version of myself, but it's still maybe a little bit 
cockatoo, I'm going to say. But I, 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 you don't want to go in and look like a slob and definitely you want to read the room. I think art schools might be a little bit more lenient in that they know that they're getting creative people in, which tend to be a part of all different kinds of trends, but you don't want to come in with a stain on your shirt and with your hair all messed up and things like that. You want to look presentable, whatever presentable means within that context, if that makes sense. You don't have to wear a business suit. It's right. not like you're interviewing at a law firm oh or something like that. And it is to be a student. So I don't think it's like that. But like Lauren said, I mean, not embarrassing. Moose Bandit says, are these tips applicable to international schools too? I don't know a lot about the international schools. However, I think basic practices like knowing how to speak articulately or having an idea about art history and contemporary art, I would imagine those are probably applicable. Yeah. Maya Hika says, so do you need to tell them your inspiration as well within the history or can that be found in other media like books and movies? Great question. They like it when you talk about things outside of art as well. I think that there is a place for talking about the art history portions, but when you bring up a movie or some part of your life experience or a book that really meant a lot to you and can explain how that is applicable to your artwork, that again shows this more human personal side of you that is really engaging and they they look out for that. They don't want it to be oh, I'm a serious artist only doing serious art things. And that's why I actually think sometimes people that are coming in with a degree that's not an art degree end up having a bit of an advantage in interviews because as long as your portfolio is cohesive and put together, the degree that you got when you were an undergrad, if it's different than art, can only add to your very interesting story of how you came to the art world and how you can take these things that you got maybe from textiles or business or cooking culinary school and brought it into art. Also, if you think about it this way, Yale is considered to be the top MFA program and a lot of people for painting. For a lot of people who go to say art school, like say RISD, a lot of them want to go to Yale. And think about this, if you went to some other school that is not RISD, that's maybe a liberal arts college, you're going to look a little bit more unusual than the average RISD student who applies to Yale. So I actually think that it's something I would try to emphasize. I mean, you have to relate it back to your practice. You, you can't just say, oh, I, I dumped medicine and now I'm here. You, know, you, you can't yeah. do something like that. Actually, Clara, that is an interesting point because I went in as a student, I ended up playing that up in my interviews where I went in as someone who had dropped out of RISD and that always turns heads because why would you ever drop out of RISD and go to a, you know, not RISD school for undergrad? And so that led into more things about having art be more publicly available and all of that. And it made more sense. Oh, this is why you're into alternative art education. Oh, this is why you're going to a state school that has, that is more publicly open. You know what I mean? And that's also great because it's specific to the program. Right. Not every yes. single MFA program is structured that way. So that's also representative of you doing your research on the school, that right. you're not just blindly looking at every single school as being the same scenario. So that's great. Exactly. C. Cantrell says, I had an interviewer ask me, what can you do in an MFA program that you cannot do on your own? This was a really helpful question for me. Well, Lauren, how did you answer that question? I, I got this question too. And I think one of the things that I responded with was that there were certain things in, I, I was living in New Hampshire, first of all, at the time. And there are a lot of things not available in New Hampshire that are available at the school. So one of the things I said was actually learn how to use power tools. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's something I feel very 
upset about that I never got to learn in undergrad. So power tools. Another one was uh, to learn how to not learn how to, but to learn from people that weren't white men or women, which were all I'd had. You were my only teacher of color my entire career in teaching period a uh, learning period. So uh, having different learning experiences that you obviously cannot get in the particular space that you're in is helpful. Moose Bandit says, what if I just really like exploring and learning about art? I don't want to teach, I just like learning. I think you probably want to get more specific for an MFA interview because I think the assumption is, oh, if you want a school, of course you want to learn. But the thing is, Learning at the MFA level, it's not the same thing as learning at the BFA level, because what you're really trying to learn how to do is engage critically with your work and to contextualize your work. And it's not about, oh, who can draw the most realistic peach? People don't care about that at the MFA level. In fact, if that's your goal, that's probably not a good fit for most right. MFA programs. So I think as long as you get more specific about what it is you want to learn. And it's not just, oh, I want to gather knowledge. Like you have to dig a little deeper. What do you think, Lauren? Yeah. Another question that I got in applying to a few places or in my interviews at those places was what classes outside of the art department would you take that would be applicable to your practice? So they, that first of all, that's asking, okay, have you looked at our course offerings really fully? And have you done your research? And also what specific things do we have that can apply to the things that you're doing? So I was looking for classes in ornithology because I use bird plumage for colors and patterns and all of that. I've still not taken a class in ornithology, but still on my list. <laughs> Lauren, did they ever ask you what book you're currently reading? Yes. Yeah. No, I, I, I just, um, I, I got asked that. At, I got asked that every interview I did. <laughs> And they, they always treat it as this question that's like, oh, it's specific to us. What what are you reading? We're, we're so, in, we're interested in books. What are you reading? <laughs> it, it always, but it always catch or caught me off guard. One, because I have a lot of favorite books and two, because I don't actually read that much in a given year. I'm a very slow reader and I also have a lot of jobs and things. And also I don't want to give a bad book that you don't want to be pretentious about it you don't just want to give like i am i am reading about marxism i am reading <laughs> capital <laughs> i'm reading infinite jest don't give something like that but also don't give something like i am reading the latest 50 shades of gray <laughs> 50 shades of gray has to do specifically what maybe you paint or draw or perform about bad pop culture references or something but what i'm saying is you can be honest about what you're reading to an extent <laughs> hannah says how important is the interview compared to all the other components of the mfa application my application i feel is well-rounded but i get anxious in interviews the first thing i would say hannah everyone's nervous when they interview it yeah. doesn't matter who you are and when I have interviewed people in the past, let's say I interviewed four people in a day, they're all nervous. Like that, that's the baseline of interviews is everybody is nervous. It's just how do people handle that? And are they noticeably prepared? And are they respectful? I mean, I feel like half the interview process is what I want to have coffee with you. That, that's sort of how I evaluate people sometimes. I don't yeah. know what you think, Lauren. Yeah, it is kind of like a coffee date. It's definitely like a coffee date. I think one thing that should be some peace of mind is that if you've been asked for an interview by a school, it means that they already like your work. They already respect you. So you're not coming in to someone who you're not coming into a space where people are 
hating on you or anything. They are actually interested in what you have to say. And yes, they have to make a judgment ultimately of who is going to get in and who they're going to take a pass on. But my experience watching all of this play out is that they come into this much more wanting to learn about you than wanting to just block you out and put you down. And Lauren, I know that you interviewed at a school where they were really trying to get you on board. Like they really were trying to convince you, come here, not yes. somewhere else. What was that like? That was really stressful. That was actually probably the most stressful interview I had because I am a, I felt really bad. I, I wasn't totally sure and I felt bad for not being sure. And I was also waiting on other schools to get a good sense. So if you get into that situation, one, you're, you're very lucky. First of all, count yourself lucky. Treat it like being at a car dealership a little, a little bit where you are in a position where you've got two places or three places that maybe like you a lot and want to fight for you. They want to have the best candidate see if you can get a deal on your tuition, say so-and-so place is offering this, be very communicative, don't just shut down. I felt like in my situation, I kind of shut down because I get really nervous, like being playing hardball. I'm <laughs> not that kind of person, but that is actually a service to them if they can at least get some feedback on that. Jessica is asking, is it ever too early to prepare for an MFA? I want to get one, but I'm still in community college. Honestly, don't think about it until you're about to apply for that year. Because in retrospect, I don't think I would have done anything differently in undergrad had I thought in advance, oh, I want to get an MFA because so much changes yeah. artistically. When I was in art school, I was like, I'm a figurative oil painter. And I'm like, oil painting, what's that? Like, it's, you, you just can't predict where your life is going to go. So I don't think it's a good idea to prepare that early. I think once you're out of school and you finish your undergrad, then, yeah, you can start thinking about it. I don't know. What's your advice, Lauren? Yeah, I feel similarly. Actually, there's a thing that happens that I have experienced where if you are thinking too hard about the MFA portfolio, your studio practice suffers for it. You end up trying to make work that you think is going to please a certain body of people. And that ends up feeling maybe less genuine and less free and less risk-taking than if you just went about your practice and kind of did your thing until you felt, oh, hey, I'm, I'm ready to go to the next level. The first two years that I applied to school, I was really focused on like wanting to get in. And I think that that was a negative experience. And then when I let go and really thought about what I was doing and why I was doing it and hey, I kind of just need to move on now at this point, it felt more natural. And I think that that came across both in my portfolio and my interview. W315 says, is it possible to learn to engage critically with your work outside of an MFA program? It absolutely is. I mean, we yeah. do that with you guys here with the portfolio critiques in our Discord and everybody making exchanges about their work for sure. I think the difference is that it's just not as concentrated because in an MFA program, I mean, if we weren't in COVID, you would be on campus, you'd be talking to people every single day. So you definitely get a much more immersive experience. Whereas here, you could come hang out with us every day, you could come once every six months. So there's not a lot of information that it's like, you must do this today or you're going to fail the program. You don't have that. But right. there are opportunities, but you do have to be pretty active about it. It's not going to come to you. Right. You have to involve yourself in art prof is a great place to start. I should say, first of all, we do, as Claire said, we do a lot of things that also happen in these kinds of programs. But I, I think that it is extremely helpful to engage in your art community in the particular 
movements or or classes or galleries or events that interest you or that are in your field doing residencies can help you get in contact with these kinds of people going to what do you call them talks artist talks this these are helpful uh, there are some programs, portfolio type developing programs that get visiting artists that come in, have crit groups that can also help with that. There's lots of options outside of actually getting an MFA. I think the difference is that you have to create that program yourself. You right. don't enroll and then are given the structure. That's the difference. I mean, there's other differences as well, but that's the primary one. Yeah. Amanda says, I'm a freshman in college. I'm still debating on getting my MFA solely if I'd be able to pay off student debt or not. It's a big decision. I mean, MFA programs are not cheap in the U.S. Do you have any advice for that, Lauren? Yeah. <laughs> MFAs, the, the biggest thing is that MFAs do not guarantee you a better paying job after you get out of them. They do let you teach in academia. They do let you maybe do some curating or art writing, but these jobs do not necessarily pay well and you can't just go as a financial move. It is a financial risk to go. So that being said, it is helpful to look at programs that either offer uh, free tuition, very reduced tuition, public schools are really great, places that have scholarships, do look beyond just the top five or ten schools. There are plenty of options available that are really, really good and will offer you that great academic setting. I mean, the top programs like Yale and Columbia, they're not going to offer fully funded positions at all. But if you do your research, there are fully funded programs. It's just they don't tend to be in like the top three or four programs. But you can get a really good deal if you do your research, because like Lauren, you said, that school really wanted you, right? And yeah. probably because some schools are not in the top ranked number of schools. And so sometimes they do have trouble attracting students. And so they usually need to offer something that's a little bit more attractive for potential students. But that's why I would just say to watch our stream about should I get an MFA? Because I don't know that a lot of people know that the MFA does not guarantee a lot of things. Yes, yeah. you can teach, but all the other stuff, you're not guaranteed gallery representation. You're not guaranteed residence. You're really not guaranteed anything beyond I can teach in academia, right? I mean, there's so many other things you can get. I'm just talking about you will do this. Like it's given right. to you once you get the MFA. Right. It's not super concrete. The, when you when you go to your MFA, there are certain magical things that happen where you do get connections to people that can get you better representation at a place or maybe a more interesting job. Maybe you find something with a highly acclaimed person that can help you get by to the next level to an area that's more stable. But in, in general, it's, it's not going to give you anything solid. This is really, if you want to do an MFA, it's really about, okay, I am at a place in my practice where I need some outside help and I need to really be with a bunch of artists that are also working towards this, working towards a deeper understanding of their work. Valerie says, does the location of study impact the qualifications one receives from an MFA, for example, studying in the US compared to Europe? I don't think it's that it impacts your qualifications as much as it is that it really impacts who your connections end up being. Because a huge part of doing an MFA program is making professional connections and getting in touch with people who are in the contemporary art world and if you think about it this way, if you go to art school in Germany, everybody you meet is in Germany. And so your connections will be there. If you go to school in New York City, the people who teach there probably live in New York City. Now, if you go to school in Kansas, 
and you want to show in a New York City gallery, it's going to be way, way tougher. So in that sense, location does matter for an MFA. In a way, it does not for a BFA. I don't know. What's your take, Warren? Yeah, I have to say it's 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 not it, it really is location as in geographical where is your body placed right now because so living in New Hampshire even though I was commuting down to New York quite a bit one thing that was always an issue was say a gallery or a dealer or a curator or someone wanted to do a studio visit with me. How are they going to do a studio visit? Are they going to really take the time to drive up four or five hours to New Hampshire to go to my parents' basement to see my work? That's not that's not really feasible for a risk that they're taking for that time that they're putting in. So your body being in a place, your studio being in a place, that in itself, it kind of dictates who is going to come see your work or who, where your work is going to be exposed. That's a pretty big difference because when people can't see the work in person, that's a pretty large disadvantage. If they're thinking about giving you a show or want to interact with you in some way, I would definitely keep that under consideration. We have an Art Prof Share today. Art Prof Share is where one of you creates artwork in response to one of our videos. So the Art Prof Share today is from Maria Leanne Pat Patinen. Sorry, I know I didn't say that correctly. Anyway, we're going to look at Maria's piece. And Maria explains in their artist statement that they were actually having a difficult time picking a color palette for this sketch. But then... This video that explores blue and orange complementary colors popped up on YouTube. And Maria says that one of their biggest takeaways was mentioning the use of some, quote, muddy, dirty colors to balance out the saturation of the other colors as well. And that one of the artworks that we showed was by Ralph McQuarrie, who is the godfather of concept art, really inspired the color palette of the drawing because of the really bright oranges and the sunlight, cool blues really drew them in. And so you can see Maria ended up doing this piece, which is very much a play on the blue and orange complementaries. How do you think Maria did, Lauren? I love the way that this orange feels very much like light. It actually reminds me of the Terrell piece where you're in that orange room and it all feels like light. It's very believable. I actually wish that we could just use this for our seeing shadows stream that we have later because I'm also very excited by how solid the light and shadow form shadows are on this figure here. It's amazing. I just want to say that my Hika is live with us in the chat. We're so glad you can watch this live. And they are saying thank you, Art Prof, so much for these streams. You know what I really like about this piece, Lauren, is even though the orange and blue is quite clear, and, and really, Maria, you are doing such a great job getting the orange to pop. Because for me, the blue recedes a little bit, but you need yeah. that because you can't have everything pop. That's not going to balance very well. And yet I love this little touch of blue on the headphone. Do you see that? It's yeah. It's so minor. Yeah. I mean, you, you wouldn't even notice it necessarily. And there's a little blue streak in, in the hair. orange hair. So yeah. it's really nice, Maria, because it's a piece that definitely impacts you right away like you really understand the color situation but the thing is when you look at it more carefully you start to realize that there is a lot more going on color wise it's very thoughtful that those <laughs> those marks that you pointed out i did not see those at first but now that i see them they're like little easter eggs because i also know in painting that doing a blue blue reflective light or shadow on brown is a, a secret candy awesome thing that you can put into paintings that I've seen in, in oil paintings and acrylic paintings. So I love seeing it here in this, what I, I think is a digital piece. It's a great little poke reference technical skill. So nice work, Maria. We're so excited to see this. And if any of you guys want to be considered for a YouTube shout out, 
via an ArtProf share, just go to artprof.org. You want to click on tutorials. There is a purple button. If you click on it, that will take you to the ArtProf share submission form. So you can send us your stuff and we will consider it for a shout out. Or if you guys just want to show us, you can tag us on Instagram art.prof and use hashtag artprofshare. We love sharing the stuff that you guys make in our Instagram stories. Artprof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a few minutes, Lauren and I will be hanging out in the Artprof Discord. We will be in the post live streams channel to chat more about clothing decisions for interviews or whatever else you guys want to talk about. Subscribe to our channel so you guys can continue to grow as an artist. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters. You guys help us keep ArtProf up and running and make it possible for us to keep all of our content 100% free and accessible to everybody. Thank you.